So hello and welcome to the End Times uh, Prophecy Bible Study. And we are on week 19. Hallelujah, week 19. And for the past few weeks, we have been um, looking more closely at the book of Revelation um, as part of our efforts to understand it more completely. Because the Apostle John promised us that if we if we read it and if we understood it, that it would be a blessing to us. And we all want to receive that blessing. And um, and so we uh, have been reading Revelation 1, 2, and 3. And today we're just going to finish off on the last church, which is the Church of Laodicea. And we have our teacher Carol back. Yay, Carol's back. <laughs> and so she'll be talking to us all about the Church of Laodicea. And then depending on how things go, hopefully we'll get into Revelation 4 as well. But we'll see how it goes. So without any further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Carol. And uh, yeah, take us on the Bible study, Carol. Amen. Yeah, thank you. And as I teach, I'd like to help you to think of... Look, I heard it this way, and I heard it this way, and let's try to debunk whatever was taught to us and really get to the facts as to why it can't be this or why it can't be that. And in particular, I'm talking about the one of the big deceptions is the pre-trib rapture, and it is very important why um, that was implemented and taught um, it's part of, um, it's part of a C.I. Schofield reference Bible to change the Bible. Um, and we don't want to be fooled or caught up in these rabbit trails that the square peg doesn't fit in the round hole. Okay. So, um, I just wanted to finish up then with, um, you know, we, we were talking about the Church of Sardis, the Church of um, Philadelphia, Thyatira, and now we're in Laodicea. So Revelation 3, 14. And unto the angel of the Church of Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen. So this is Jesus talking here. The Amen. Does anybody know what the Amen means? What's Amen? We say it in church like, when the preacher's preaching, amen, amen. <laughs> what does it mean? Anybody I know? always thought it, I always thought it meant so be it, but um, yeah. maybe not. Amen means let it be done. Truth. Maybe truth. Yes. Veritas. It means, yeah, basic, basically, yes. So, um, so you have uh, Jesus speaking. He says, unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, write these things, saith the amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, not created, like uh, some preachers will, you know, teach. Um, I know thy works, and thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Yeah, so, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth my mouth. Okay. So kind of like coffee. Anybody drink coffee, right? You like it hot and you like iced coffee, but lukewarm, it's not so good, right? <laughs> Am I right? All right. Okay. So these people, hot nor cold, what, what have you, they, they just um, are lukewarm and, um, you know, they don't even know it. They don't even know it. So that's something to be aware of. So because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and thou is not know that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Oh my gosh. Well, look, this, this church, I mean, you see churches like this. I mean, they're not cold nor hot. They're they're neither. I mean, how many churches do we see like that on television even? I mean, are they going out in the highways and the byways and spreading the gospel? And, you know, you have all these different gospels today. You have the prosperity gospel. These teachers who say, 
oh, if you do this, then you'll be prosperous. God promises to prosper you. And they just twist the word of God like that all the time. I mean, you're rich. Maybe he'll bless you. You'll you'll be blessed um, maybe in spirit, okay, spiritually, right? It doesn't always promise in monetarily ways, monetarily ways. So these people of Laodicea were rich, okay? They're arrogant because they, they have their prosperity gospel or what have you, but um, they don't know. They don't know that they're miserable, poor, blind, and naked, naked. Gosh, does anybody know how the Bible defines nakedness? So does anybody want to turn to Exodus 28, 42? And that's what make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even onto the thighs, they shall reach. And, and, um. Vicky, Isaiah 47, 2-3. to Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not meet thee as a man. Okay, so I guess according to the Bible, our thighs, our, our like bottom area, are, is um, our nakedness. Isn't it? Isn't it that if you are naked, then you are kind of um, you're kind of put to shame. So in the same way, um, the things that are exposed, you know, which are not good, um, in tall. that way, you're, you're also be put to shame. Yes, your 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 nakedness being exposed, like uh, in Habakkuk, you know, um, woe into the neighbor who gives his neighbor drink to cause him to show his nakedness. It's not that he's running around naked. It's just the fact that he's exposing his heart, his you know, what's inside. Because I guess so, for me, um, I just always. Um, so the, I'll, I, I can read two other verses, but I, I guess I always thought because it was linen breeches, wasn't it? Um, and a few weeks ago, um, we had somebody on who was talking about how the high priest had to wear linen breeches. And of course, linen is the clothing of the righteous, right? They were dressed in fine linen. And so um, I think my my theory, of course, I could be wrong, but my theory is that when it talks about nakedness, it's talking about uh, your righteousness. So in other words, you think that you are covered in these garments of righteousness. You think that you are righteous before me, but actually you are naked. So um, the two verses in the book of Revelation that use the word, well, it's been translated as naked, are Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Clothed in his righteousness. Clothed yeah. in his righteousness. I just always assume, well, that's what, that's how, that would be my suggestion is that when Jesus is talking about keeping our garments and not being found naked and seeing shame, that it is about righteousness. And so then the other time uh, is Revelation 17, verse 16, speaking of mystery Babylon, the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Um, and so I think for me, that's what that so. So in other words, how do we lose our garments? How do we become naked? It is by um, um being lured into mystery Babylon, the harlot, and and God will punish mystery Babylon by revealing her nakedness because nakedness is also about a covering, isn't it? So I think that's the other thing is is that in the great tribulation, um, you know, we want to be covered. We don't want to be. I mean, obviously the enemy will make war with us, but we want to be under God's protection. We want to be in that place of Psalm 91, under the wings of God, 
which is his covering. So I think that's another aspect of the nakedness. And that yeah. and that Laodicea finds their covering. You know, there's another verse, which I don't know what it is, but that the rich, for the rich, their riches are, for the prosperous or the wicked, their riches are a wall, right? It's, I think it's somewhere in Proverbs. In other words, so in other words, they think because they're rich that they are covered, they're protected. It's all going to be, I'm not going to be touched by any of this, but it's a false covering. But in Revelation 17, the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, they shall hate the horse, shall make her desolate. They shall remove her covering, right? They shall make her desolate and naked. It's exposing, and it's exposing the heart. Yeah, I, th I agree. Yeah. I agree. 100%. Yeah. Just like I said in 17, where it says, I am rich and I increase in goods and have need of nothing. I said the arrogance, right? The arrogance and how God hates a haughty heart. But, you know, and poor, were they really poor? Oh, they're saying they're rich, but you're poor. I was talking about, you know, in the beginning, I, what I was getting to was, you know, we're blessed to be reading Revelation and, you know, the prosperity gospel. And what I was saying is they say you're rich monetarily. It's not necessarily monetarily. It's spiritually he doesn't promise a monetary bl blessing to everybody. And just like you said in the beginning, Laura, this is a special blessing to us who read these words. So that's what I, that's all I'm saying. So verse 18, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, the refiner's fire, <laughs> that thou mayest be rich and white raiment and thou mayest be clothed and that shame thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye sap and that thou mayest see. Now, were they physically blind? No, they weren't physically blind. Were they walking around naked? No, <laughs> of course. But, you know, I am, you know, just, just to reiterate that fact, they weren't physically naked. Normally, like when we're reading something, we always take it in the literal sense, unless it just can't be literal. And this can't be literal. <laughs> So, um, um, I just wasn't sure, Carol, and I don't have any theories, but I was just curious as to whether or not you or anybody else on the platform has a theory about, uh, uh verse 18. So, um, Jesus says, I cancel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. So I don't yeah. know if anybody has any theories about what the gold no. tried in the fire is. I do. The refiner's fire. Okay, so he, he went, because he, he chastens us, okay? So when we're purified by the fire, when 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 gold is purified, right? Um, it's kind of like, um, uh, it's kind of like, you know, the more trials we go through, the tribulation that we're going to go through, um, we're purified and, and we're made, we're made pure through the fire. <laughs> look okay you can get comfortable in your wealth but but look as soon as you have something major go wrong in your life you're purified you come to a you have a come to jesus moment <laughs> you know what i'm saying you have a come to jesus moment and it's like why it's like oh my gosh when's the last time i've been in the highways and the byways pre preaching the gospel and what i'm supposed to be doing i'm just living my life i've been too comfortable here right yeah, and I can I can hear what you're saying, and that could that could that could be what it means. So what you're saying is is I cancel you to allow me to refine you in the refiner's fire. Is that is that how you would maybe rephrase yes, it? Be, yes, because listen, let's think of the opposite. Let's <clears throat> think of Romans chapter one. Let's think of um, a reprobate. A reprobate mind is a rejected mind. Like when you have. Um, somebody who is a reprobate they rejected god and for example like um reprobate silver is rejected silver okay it's it's not um pure okay so let me just see here jeremiah 6 30 you want to read it Do you have it so jeremiah 6 uh starting at verse 26 O daughter of my people gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes, 
Make thee mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and try thy, their way. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. And that right. was a message to the daughter of his people. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's also a verse in Malachi 3, verse 4. Um, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. It's beautiful. I mean... Yeah, good one, Vicky. <clears throat> so... Like we go through the fire. What is the fire? It's trials and tribulations. You know, so it says here, I counsel thee to buy, buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. And the one right before that, he he he's telling them, oh, you think you're rich, <laughs> you know. But and then he goes into saying, you're you're wretched and you're naked and you're poor. And then he says, you know, he talks about being tried in the fire. And so thou mayest be rich. We got to go through the fire. We got to go through the tribulation in order to be, you know, look at Job. At the end of Job, he says, oh, forgive me. I, I didn't really know you, you know? I mean, he went through it all. He thought he knew him. And then, you know, at the end, he says, oh, I didn't really know you. But he went through the trial and realized so, who he was. Um, I guess it was just the idea of, you know, it just the way it's worded, I guess. You know, it doesn't say, allow me to purify you. It allow me to burn off the dross. It says, buy gold, refine and fire. So I don't have any other revelation than what you've shared. I don't know if anybody else has, has anybody else ever thought that they received any revelation on that? I think it's um, yeah? the chastening. It's being in the fire. It's going through okay. the um, whatever tribulations you have to go through, and um, him working on you to um, iron out the knots, and so that you know you become like um, a bride without spot or wrinkle, and then he will you know he say come I will come and knock on your door, and um, it's up to you to open the door so that I can come in. It's open. It's up to you to say yes and be obedient, and then you know he will work with you. In the way that you know he wants to. So as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, and be zealous therefore and repent. So look, there's arguments that go back and forth, um, and we take another look at this another time. But if God didn't love them, He wouldn't rebuke them and chasten them. Like your your child, you know. Um, are you going to, if you tell them don't eat those cookies before dinner and they go ahead and do it anyway, and you just say, oh, oh, well, you know, no, you chasten your child because you love them and you don't want them to get fat and <laughs> you want them to eat good food, right? And just, just whatever <laughs> example. <clears throat> so, um, and be zealous, therefore, and repent. I mean, we see in Proverbs, of course. Uh, let's go to Proverbs 13, 24. Yeah, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasten him be times. I forget what be times means, but uh, I think. Maybe often. I, I forget, but I, I, it's it's some yeah something to that effect often or at the time or something like that yes because you know you don't it, it you, the saying goes oh spare the rod spoil the child but it's actually spare the rod hate the child 
you know, they twist the words all the time, don't they? I did just look up that word betimes. And yeah, I, I assumed it meant often as well. Um, according to BibleStudyTools.com, uh, the definition is to seek, seek early or earnestly, look early or diligently. So it seems like it might be more the sense of, you know, who is it, like as soon as possible, diligently, urgently. Yeah, yeah, at the time. At the time of the crime. <laughs> at the time of the crime. Yeah, that could be one. So in other words, you don't just let these things kind of go. It's kind of like, no, right. it's swift. <laughs> yeah, and I, I know you don't like the NIV, but I'll just see what it says there. It says, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. So, yeah, so yeah. that sense, same kind of sense. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Good. So, you know, I'm, yeah, there's, you know, controversy. Um, so some people say the Laodiceans were not saved. Some people say, oh, they were saved because they're chastened. You know, uh, if he didn't love us, he wouldn't chasten us. But, you know, that is something to go into. It's a letter to the churches. It's a letter to the churches, exactly. Like, surely, surely that <laughs> but, sorts that question he, out. <laughs> I will tell you, the dispensationalist, and you can study this on your own, this dispensationalist gospel sort of thing has um, ages. And they say this Laodiceans are not saved. And this is all part of the deception of the Jews are still chosen for today and they're under the Old Testament law and the pre-tribulation rapture. And it all goes together and how they um, twisted the word of God in the modern day Bible versions. Okay, so that has a lot to do with it. But we're, wow. we can't get into that. That's a whole different teaching. But yeah, no, that's um, okay. Okay, so behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, a lot of people will twist this as well. And it says, they'll say, see, the Laodiceans were not saved because this proves that Jesus didn't come into, into them, and but it doesn't say that. It says in space two. It doesn't say like, you know, I'm going to come into him, right? Like I am going to go in the church to the pulpit, or you would say, you know, you're going, you know, you're going in the church and you're going to go in the pulpit to preach. Or you could, they twist it to say into, you know, you don't go into the pulpit. You go, don't go into the pulpit and close it up and you're inside. So there's a big difference there with in to him and we'll sup with him, not into. Okay. So um, that's what I want, a, a little point I wanted to make. And then, could, I, could I make a very brief comment? But you know, on verse 20, when you were talking about that, um, I was just thinking, you know, when it says, you know, um, if, if the person has to open the door, etc. The thing is, um, the Lord doesn't, doesn't kind of force us anyway, if you like, he's a gentleman, you know. So it doesn't mean that you're actually not necessarily opening the door to accept the gospel. It just means that, I mean, whatever the Holy Spirit says to us, we still have free will to either ignore or to obey. So, yeah, anyway, so that's why I was thinking, you know, I don't know why they necessarily um, are thinking that they are not saved. So, Because there's a big if in there, right? There's a big if and and you know, he's going to come in, you do have to open the door, right? Because, <laughs> of course, it does beg the question. It's fine and dandy for us to kind of say, well, of course they're saved. But if they're saved, then what does this verse mean? And uh, it's, uh, if any man hear my voice, isn't it? And so how many Christians, you know, I know that there have been books written, how to hear the voice of God. You know, I think that that is, I think that's the sense of it, isn't it? It's, it's kind of like, I want to have a relationship with you, you know. And so 
and so you know i'm knocking on the door and and but when i knock on the door you, you don't let me in so that we can sit and have dinner and have a conversation and chat and have a relationship to to him that overcometh i will grant to sit with me in the throne even as i also overcame and am, and am set down with my father in his throne he that hath an ear let him hear and what the spirit say unto the churches and isn't it wonderful, this promise in verse 21 to him that, you know, you, you kind of you want to give up on the church of Laodicea, don't you? You want to kind of think, OK, you guys are just lost, really. But, you know, to him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. I mean, his mercy is just endless, isn't it? Yeah. It's like it's it's like, guys, I'm still here for you if you will just turn and repent. Beautiful. Any other things that people want to say about Revelation 3, the Church of Laodicea? Also in chapter 3, I know last time we discussed just one quick point is that, um, and I always want to try to debunk as we go along, like I said, but, you know, in verse 10, and I've heard somebody say this, that, okay, so this is the timing of the rapture. It's in chapter 3, because look, because in verse 10, it says, Hast thou kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. And I think we accomplished that. We, we proved that the hour of temptation is not the tribulation. It is God's wrath. Okay. We talked about that before. So uh, I just wanted to clarify that. I, I forgot to do that earlier. Okay. So we know that the rapture is not in three. We proved that it's not in three. So... Chapter four, after this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven and the first voice, which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me and he, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be here after. Stop there. So um, this is where the pre-tribbers will say, and we've got to be ready for whatever they come up with. And this is why I keep emphasizing this, because um, you have to be ready to teach this to pastors, to whoever is teaching this false pre-tribulation rapture. They're, they're, they're sending their sheep down um, oof, a wrong path. But anyway, um, so... In Revelation 1, verse 19, it says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be thereafter. Okay? So that's where we are. We're in the thereafter in, in chapter 4. Okay? Because if... <clears throat> If these, if um, the Laodicean church, like they say, church age, this age, if it was, they said, oh, we're not in the Laodicean age yet. If that dispensationalist is true, then that would have been the hereafter, but it wasn't. So we have to be careful on timelines here. So <clears throat> we can see here that they say, look, look, you got a trumpet. No. Let's go to Isaiah uh, 58 one. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. So is it a trumpet or is it like a trumpet? What's it describing? The loudness? Yeah, how loud that, it is yeah right so it's not a trumpet okay it says it says here in verse one i heard well first the voice which i heard was as it were it's not a trumpet it's as it were it's talking about how loud it is so we can we can throw that out the out the door <laughs> because there's no trumpet when the second coming is a trumpet will be there. There's not going to be a voice like a trumpet. It doesn't say that in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. 
Okay. All right. So we've ruled that out. That's just not going to be. All right. So, and immediately I was in the spirit and I beheld a throne that was set in heaven and one sat upon the throne. <laughs> so this is what they will say again is see, see, there he is. He's up before the throne in spirit, in spirit. Okay. So, all right. So he's one person before the throne. One person before the throne in spirit is not, is not um, the rapture. Okay. So if one guy, isn't it, isn't the rapture all believers of all ages before the throne, multitudes before the throne? Let's, well, well, let's, you know, I mean, so the, the trumpet, of course, is, is talking about volume one person in spirit before the throne. Aren't we going to have bodily resurrection? There's no bodily resurrection here. Okay, so um, there's no meeting in the clouds. There's no Jesus. You know, it's, it's not a bodily resurrection. But let's take a look at what sounds more like the rapture. And this is what I want to do. I want to just kind of bounce back and forth a little bit. Revelation 6, 12, we, hit, we have the sixth seal, okay? I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars fell from, hev from, from heaven to earth and to the earth. Okay, so here's the thing. What did we just read? Revelation 6. Revelation 6, the sixth seal, we just saw the sun and moon being darkened, right? Now we're into, into chapter 7, all right? This, the wrath of the Lamb is coming, okay? At the end of, of chapter 6, okay, the great day has come. And we went through all these scriptures where it's the same day, the same day, the same day, okay? So in let's go to 7-9. After these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the, before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Okay. Speaking out with the loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God. Who sits on the throne and to the Lamb? Okay, Ramesh. So, does a great multitude sound like the rapture, or does one person in the spirit sound like a rapture? I mean, would it, look at the timing of this. We went through Matthew 24, and it said, immediately after the tribulation, the sun, the moon, and the stars will be darkened, okay? And then the great coming in the clouds. Now, so I wanted to also point out, if you, if you will, is Revelation 7, verse 13 and 14. It says, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Where'd they come from? In other words. And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the lamb. So now we have this confirming these are the saints that came out of the great tribulation. Okay, like it matches with Matthew 24, um, Mark 13, and Luke 21. So after the tribulation, sun and moon are darkened. After the tribulation, sun and moon are darkened. After the tribulation, sun and moon are darkened. Four times now, five times we have read, after the tribulation, the sun and moon are darkened, and then he's coming in the clouds, okay? Does it seem like that in verse in chapter 4? Or does this seem more like? We also studied this. 1 Thessalonians 4, it says here, in 17, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it says, 
and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, was he ever with the Lord? Or does it sound like um, Revelation 14, certain 13, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, and henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and, and upon the cloud, one sat unto like the Son of Man, having his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And, you know, every time you see something like, you know, well, here you see an angel. You see an angel gathering. You see the clouds. You see... Um, you know, a gathering, okay? But you don't see that in four. And then just to point out, um, which is Revelation 8, verse 1. So in other words, the next chapter. So in other words, what we're reading about this great multitude is an interlude between Revelation 6, the great day of his wrath has come, and then Revelation 8, 1, when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. So Revelation 7 is very clearly placed in between the opening of the sixth seal and the opening of the seventh seal. Yeah, for sure. Let's just go back real quick. <clears throat> May I just interject one other proof there, um, which is Revelation 20, you know. And so um, if people say that uh, when John is told to come up hither, and they say, oh, look, that is the rapture, which is what you're about to read. If they say that that is the rapture, and then the seals are broken, and then the trumpet sound, and then the wrath, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then they put this huge multitude at the begin. I don't know, they either put them at the beginning, but then, but then they speak about a whole bunch of tribulation saints I, I mean, the, the point is, is that none of that matches up with uh, Revelation 20, you know, which is, I saw thrones and they sat upon them. Judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned. And then it says, this is the first resurrection. <laughs> so Correct. there's no way that you can have a pre-trib. Re re I mean, Re Revelation 20. Not even 20. a <laughs> Not even Revelation a 20 is really the only, the only verse you really need, because at the end of the day, you cannot have a pre-trib rapture resurrection, because then you need to have a second one after the mark of the beast so yeah revelation sure. 11 too i mean that that's really yeah they, they all as you say they, they all, all bind together they all go they all go together because yeah. it all matches once you believe what the bible says instead of what falsities are taught to you it just flows so well it just just goes well did everybody follow that okay any questions comments uncertainties um I think it would never have occurred to me to think that in the first place. So, <laughs> but I'm being a bit simple minded here, I think, because <laughs> it's obvious, you know, one person there. But um, sorry if that doesn't sound very profound. But oh, no, that's okay because, you know, I was taught that. It just I was taught that too. Okay. And yeah, you I, thought I was taught it, but reading it, I just wouldn't have thought it, you know. So. Right. When you read it yourself, and that's, that's the problem. Uh, with these preachers, they interject so much of their own words. You really have to be uh, have discernment and think. Okay, wait, whoa, wait, what does that say again? So, <clears throat> sorry, but yeah, right. the key. If it weren't for the fact that I've just heard so many preachers <laughs> preach it over and over and over again, yeah. you know, there it is. There's the rapture, Revelation four. Come up hither. There it is. If Ooh. I hadn't heard it come out of their own mouths, I wouldn't believe it either. But there are so many that teach it. And and I've come across so many Christians who you try to say to them, you know, um, that we're that we go through the tribulation and and it is such a shock to them. They can't they can't process that information. They have been taught all their lives that they will not see the tribulation. And when you come and say, Well, the Bible says they they see you 
as obviously you're deceived yeah. and they see you as somebody like I had somebody say, oh, well, you know, have fun. Like they, they, they really are disparaging. No, they're and, angry. Even angry. At you. They I are had angry. someone tell me yeah. I was going to lose my salvation. Exactly. Because I believe the Bible, <laughs> you know, exactly. Really, it's, it's terrible. And that is why I am so against the CI Schofield reference Bible. A lot of with the, I mean, I, I had the NIV for 20 years until I studied Bible versions, but uh, didn't realize how I was being deceived. This is the devil. A lot of these preachers don't know they're deceived. So if we want to continue back in Revelation 4 again, that'd be great. So, um, all right. So let me just... Yeah, here. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, the throne was set in heaven and one sat upon the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like Jasper and sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne and in, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon these seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting in clothing and white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold okay here's another example of what pastors will say see there you go there's 24 elders wait a minute is 24 men representing representing all nations tongues and tribes um, so let's go to Titus, if you would, one, uh, five. Okay. This is Paul talking to Titus. Okay. Okay. This is who these elders are. Who are the elders? All right. For this cause left I thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordained, ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. So here we see in verse five, we see elders, verse six, it's used interchangeably with bishop. And we see these words, a lot of words always being used interchangeably, right? So an elder is a bishop. Or today, a pastor, Pastor Ramesh, Pastor whoever, you know, if you call yourself a pastor, that's what what that would be. Um, <clears throat> so those are pastors. I, you know, I don't think 24, I mean, no, to be seated there, right? 24 pastors or elders or bishops, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to call them, um, represents all nations tongues and whatever so it's anybody not, have any other thoughts i mean yeah it's not a particular but it's given only elder but it means uh as as sister uh carol said that i agree with that uh maybe pastors and bishops and some of the, elders and some of the uh, uh church elders and uh, that who who follow who follow the jesus and who is the faith and who is to uh, run the churches like that also people say yes i agree with you sister carol and you know i mean who they are i guess we'll find out <laughs> so uh yeah. so that's i mean i mean that is one possibility it is definitely one possibility and um so when I look up the word uh, in the BibleStudyTools.com, um, okay. so it, it talks about a term of rank or office. Um, so there's among the Jews, which I guess we probably won't talk about, among the Christians. So those who presided over the assembly. So that would be the sense that you're talking of. But then it's got a third option, term of rank or office, the 24 members of the heavenly Sanhedrin or court seated on thrones around the throne of God. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't know who the 24 elders are. So this is just simply my own theory. Um, I think the fact that they are sitting there before the rapture and the resurrection and also the timing of it 
um, in terms of where where John is. So you know, this is so he's in a vision two thousand years ago, and one could argue: is he seeing the present? Is he seeing the future? Whatever. I guess for me, I kind of always thought of the 24 elders as most likely to be um, of the, of the not the patriarchs, but in other words, the pre-Jesus era. So it could be patriarchs, it could be um, like people like Abraham, uh, Moses, Noah, Job, um, Very well. Isaiah, you know, so that was always my take on it, that they weren't necessarily... New Testament believers, but they it could be like, so John the Baptist was the greatest. So John the Baptist could be there. So that was always my take on it, as opposed to... I mean, they have been the great men of God. Whoever great, they are. great, great men of God, of whatever yes. era. Yeah, but yeah. not necessarily, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I don't, I don't, I, for me, and I don't know, I don't know who they are. <laughs> but for me, it's not necessarily those who have overseen a New Testament church is what mm. I'm trying to say. I've never no, 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 it that way. <clears throat> so exactly, so, I agree. We'll okay, find out. so they're clothed in white raiment, and then they say this. They say, "See, they're clothed in white raiment, so they're bodily risen." Yeah, but spirits can spirit can the souls of them have have um be clothed in white raiment anybody know go to revelation 6 11 and white robes were given unto every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also had and their brethren should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. All right. So these were killed for the cause of Christ. They were persecuted. It was the war with the saints. And they're before the throne. They gi were given white robes. Did they f physically have a bodily resurrection at this point? No. No, we didn't get to the rapture yet. Because, you know... The verse before, verse 10, it says, they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell in the earth? So he, the, the avenging of the blood didn't happen yet. And they're clothed in white robes. So the point you were trying to make there is that these are not people who are part of the rapture and resurrection. Bodily resurrected. Exactly. That's that was the point, point you yeah. were trying to make. Oh, yes. yes. All right, so verse five, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. And there were seven lamps of burning, fire burning before the throne, which are seven spirits of God. And we covered that in Revelation, Revelation 1, Revelation 2, Revelation 3. Um, so we established the seven spirits of God, that Jesus has the seven spirits of God. All right, so verse six, <clears throat> and before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had face like a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest day, not day and night, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. I sometimes, you know, I mean, you see all these descriptions of that, you know, what that would look like, and it's just so... <clears throat> overwhelming don't you think i mean what what was just described here <laughs> it's like holy moly all right so let's take a look at um ezekiel 1 4 through 10 then i looked and behold a whirlwind was coming out of the north a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its mist 
like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also from within, from within it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this is their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side. And each of the four had the face of an eagle. These were their faces. All right, so there's a couple of differences, and maybe Laura is already looking up uh, definitions, but in um, Revelation 4, we see they call, they call them four beasts, and in Ezekiel, they are called living creatures, okay? There's a little difference there. In Revelation 4, they had six wings, and Ezekiel, they had four wings. Um, anybody else see anything different? So in Ezekiel, each creature seems to have four faces, whereas yeah, I think in the heavy. throne, they, there's four different beasts, each with a different face. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Okay. And, and what else? Something about a calf. Did we see a calf in Ezekiel? They say like calf. Yes, an ox. Oh, ox. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's that is an ox. An ox is a, a baby. A uh, calf is a baby. Yeah, ox. I mean, calf is a baby, a baby ox. Baby yeah, calf, ox. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to Ezekiel ten. I'm just going to read this. Just I'm going to brief over this, okay? Because there's a, a different point I want to make here. So Ezekiel 10, um, I'm just in, in one, I looked and behold, the firmament was above at the head of the cherubims, S, uh, there appeared uh, over as it were sapphire stone and appearance of likeness of the throne. Um, and you see in verse two, you have cherubims, verse three, cherubims. Um, now the cherubims in verse four, and the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub, cherub sing, singular. Uh, verse five, sound of the cherubim's wings were heard. Um, <clears throat> verse six, oh, take fire from between the wheels and between the cherubims. Verse six, verse seven, you have cherubims with an S. Verse eight, you have cherubims. Verse 9, you have, when I looked up and behold, the wheels of the cherubims, one of the wheel by the cherub, and the other wheel by the cherub, another cherub. Let's go down to 14. And every one had four faces. First, a face, face was a face of a cherub. The second was a face of a man. And the third was a face of a lion. And the fourth was a face of an eagle. So you have beasts, you have living creatures, and now there's calling them cherub or cherubims. If you go over to <clears throat> 17, it says, when they stood and these stood, and when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also where the spirit of the living creature was in them. The glory of the Lord departed off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. Verse 19. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. And when they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And everyone stood at the door east of the gate of the Lord's house and the glory of God 
of Israel was over was over them above. This living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Shebar, and I knew that they were cherubims. So we have another name. <laughs> so cherubims, they're cherubims. Every one had four faces apiece, and every one had four wings, like the likeness of hands of man was under their wings. I mean, I think if I saw that, I'd be running. I don't know. I don't know about you all, but um, wow. I okay. But um, have any of you heard about the faces of these beasts? or living creatures, or cherubim, or cherubims, or whatever, within the Gospels. I heard this once upon a time, and <clears throat> probably about 12 years ago, and it just stuck with me. And I'm not saying that this is what it is, but I just think the Bible is so poetic, and you have pictures of this in, in pictures of one thing in this verse, and you have pictures of another thing, and then you see something else in that picture. So what I want to get to is the four gospels. And this, you know, may not be, but it's kind of, I think, a beautiful thing, really. So the faces of Revelation 4, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're the confirming gospels. They, they tell a lot of the same stories, but in a different way. Um, but the gospel according to Matthew describes Jesus, like you see right away, you see that um, he, he comes from a kingly line. And it describes here the kingly line, King David, King Solomon, um, that describes the kingly line. And throughout Matthew, um, Jesus is described as a lion of Judah. Um, so that's the face of the lion, okay? And then Mark, Mark um, really portrays Jesus as doing works. You see, if you have a red letter Bible, you see a lot of less, the least red letters in here. He is portrayed mostly as a servant. The calf is a, uh, or an ox or, or whatever you want to say, or cow is always portrayed throughout the Bible as a servant, you know, um, a laborer, okay, a minister, symbol. So a lot of times it, um, throughout the Bible, it'll be a, a symbolism of a minister, right, Ramesh? Have you seen that before? Yeah. So that is the face of the calf or the ox or whatever you wanted to say, the book of Mark. And then, um, you, <laughs> um, just, um, <sighs> Gosh, this is, this is beautiful too. So Luke is um, like the face of a man, like the humanity, the humanity side. Somebody knew I was going to say that, right? The humanity side of Jesus, the, um, you know, like you have in chapter three, you have Mary's genealogy, which is the man, you know, the earthly side, the, the man. Okay. So that's Luke. And then, I mean, whoever put this together is just phenomenal. <laughs> what about me? And then um, John. <clears throat> John um, talks about the deity of Christ. You have even in chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So the face of the eagle it has no genealogies in here, but every time you look up eagles in, throughout the Bible, it talks about, you know, it represents the deity or, of God or Christ, the deity. So I just thought I'd just throw that in there. And it does make sense, as it? So what you're saying yeah. is that these four faces are the four faces yeah. of Jesus, the four ministries or aspects of him. So he was the king as represented by the lion, he's the servant, as represented by the ox, he's the man, he's God made man, and so he shares in our humanity, and then he is also God, 
as represented by the eagle. And obviously, Jesus is all of those things. So, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing. You know, just like I said before, we have different words using interchangeably, but sometimes you have a little variation. Like, for example, seraphims uh, have six wings, and, and then you have cherubim, which I was pointing out, that has four wings. Okay, so a cherub, the, the etymology of the word is for the etymology of seraph or seraphim. So we have before the throne, instead of calling them beasts or living creatures, seraphim and cherubim. And the cherubim have four wings, as we read, and seraphim have six wings. That's all I wanted to point out. And can you imagine the the picture of what this looks like? <laughs> these things flap around <laughs> but what's useful for us i think is that we've now had this comparative look at the two haven't we um which i think is very useful i think it's very useful that when we see these beasts in heaven that we're reminded that these that beasts either the same beasts or similar beasts also showed up in ezekiel and i think there's even references um which i was going to look up and i didn't but i think somewhere in daniel it refers to his wheels of fire. I know I've been reading it a lot lately. Um, um, so these wheels of fire, they show up in other verses. And, and it's really important that when we see these things, that we're able to connect them. Oh, okay. That's discussing. Can I just say one more thing? I did forget something. Um, and I kind of just jumped into the seraphim and the cherubim. But uh, Isaiah 6 um, Isaiah 6, 2 said, above it stood the seraphims, each one had the six wings, which twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried to another and, and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So we see that again in Revelation 4. Isaiah. Then that was Isaiah 6, 2, and 3. I just wanted to bring that up because I did forget that. <laughs> yeah, and again, like, you know, um, I mean, just one thing that's coming to my mind, so I'm just going to say it, is that the seraphim, I think, unless, I mean, I haven't looked into this, but based on these two scriptures, these two scriptures, they seem to be sort of fixed in heaven, fixed in the throne room in heaven. Whereas the cherubim, um, you know, were sort of on the earth and were sort of this heavenly chariot, weren't they? That kind of transported the glory um, up to heaven. So maybe that's the difference between the two is that the seraphim are in the throne room the whole time and the cherubim are sort of like this heavenly chariot. I don't know. Just I mean, there could I be a lot. There. Yeah, there could be a lot of differences. I mean, between yeah. the six wings and the four wings and... Uh, yeah. Thank you. That's Very that's a good point because that's a good point. Yeah, because the the six wings we know that they're seraphim now. Okay, so they got six wings. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they're different. But the yeah. fact is, is that both beings, whether they're seraphim or cherubim, that they reflect something about Jesus. Yeah, they exactly. reflect something so, about yeah. Jesus. But, but we're getting to this. So okay, and then there's verse nine. And when those beasts gave, give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure are, are they are and were created. So that's the whole point, whether they are created and, and with six wings or four wings, and they're just so uniquely looking, uh, you know, I mean, they're, we're created for his glory. Just the thought of that, just the thought of us being created for his glory. And um, that's the point, really, I, I kind of wanted to make about that. Yeah, and it's just that he is glorious. 
you know, that he is glorious and he's, and he's otherworldly and he's like us. And yet he's nothing like us. And, and I think that's the message, isn't it? Is that he is just beyond imagination. And, you know, I, I always think that I just always felt so sorry for Ezekiel, who was trying to describe what he was seeing and this vision, you know, and it was obviously the most overwhelming thing he'd ever seen in his life and completely indescribable completely indescribable and yet he gives it that good honest go you know <laughs> and it's just like <laughs> jaw dropping yeah no oh, thank you that was fascinating lovely thank you thank you for bringing that out thank you very much carol mm -hmm. so thank you everybody for joining us today and i hope that you really enjoyed that that little talk about what's going on in the throne room and uh yeah lots of stuff that we covered there so that was really interesting so we look forward to uh finding out more i guess we'll be looking into revelation 5 next week so yeah we'll look in we'll look forward to that next week so thanks a lot have a blessed week and we'll hope to see you all next time bye bye